OK, let's try again, 204. Yes. Send my donation now, and it's done. It sends it. You click on the link, and it sees your transaction in the blockchain contemporaneously. It's right there. Was any bank involved? No. No bank was ever involved in this transaction. It went peer to peer. So the next phase of development, after we produce this on time, on budget, for $12,000, actually, not pounds I said earlier, dollars, OK? We delivered on time and on budget. We didn't raise 2.5 million. We raised 12,000. Uh, we delivered on time. The next phase of the project really was for me to create my own art, because developers are artists too. And so I decided to create this little uh, gem. It's a Bitcoin full node. It has a full copy of the blockchain on it. It also comes pre-compiled with Tor. Uh, connects to the Tor, uh, Tor Onion service by default. Um, it has IPFS, and we have the guys from IPFS right here to my left. Um, it has uh, Mulvad VPN. Well, Mulvad VPN is uh, ready to go with OpenVPN, and the resolve.config is already pre-configured pre if you want to use a VPN rather than Tor. Um, and it has GNU PG if you want to use PGP. It has uh, CryptoCat, which we're going to use uh, to communicate to a journalist a colleague of ours at the World Crypto Network live in India right now to show how somebody in, in, a, in a country anywhere in the world can start earning money, be discovered as, a, as an artist, and start publishing and speaking their mind freely without the fear of censorship. Okay? So this is live, so stuff could go wrong. Would somebody mind holding the mic for me whilst I set it up? Can I get a volunteer? Thank you very much. Fingers crossed. Okay, it's powering up. Let's see if this works. Hey, woohoo! Clap, everyone. Round of applause. Okay. Woo. First part is out of the way. Next, I need to get my head around this German layout keyboard, which, uh, uh oh, the X and the Y are not in the same place I'm expecting. And guess what the password has in it? A Y. Okay, let's try this. All right, so. Um, when I made this, I made this live on air on, on the World Crypto Network, okay? So um, I laid, uh, all the documentation is there in raw format. Uh, I do not own this. It's a CC0 project, which means you can just get the documentation off of my Git repo. Uh, my name is Chris J Mr. Chris J on, on, on GitHub. And just look for the full node project. Also, I'm at Mr. Chris Ellis on Twitter, and I tweet about this thing like the whole fucking time. So you won't have any problem finding it. I changed as little as possible in the Debian Wheezy package manager because there is a, a ton of documentation on the internet already on how to troubleshoot Debian Wheezy. I wanted to make this as easy as possible for a new category of user. So here we go. Does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, OK. Rose. I know I did, but I, ah. Uh, OK, it's Raspberry. That's the password. OK, cool. Nice one. OK. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you Bitcoin. Uh, so I just type in bits, and I pipe tab. For those of you who are non-technical, aren't familiar with command line, um, uh, you just tab to, to autocomplete. I'm going to do a dash, and I'm going to go cl uh, C, and that, that autocompletes to, to CLI, which stands for command line interface. Um, I'm then going to type in the command get info just to see where we are. And it says it's loading the block index. It says it's an error. It's not an error. It's just giving us a, a, an indication as to what it's doing. And at certain intervals, I'm going to just hit the up arrow, and I'm just going to check to see what it's doing. So whilst it's loading the blockchain, we can just have a, have a, have a quick chat about it. Um, so what does this do, and why is it important? The reason it's important, maybe I can uh, show you on my, my laptop, my hipster machine, uh, whilst I'm doing it. Yeah. So this was the presentation I gave earlier upstairs, if you were there. The reason this is important is because the blockchain is very heavily centralized at the moment. It's heavily centralized around North America and centralized in Europe. Okay? And we need to get the blockchain out into regions of the world, like Botswana, like Venezuela, like India, um, like the Koreas, preferably, um, if we can. Um, and the reason we need to do that is because it reduces the dependency on centralized services such as blockchain.info that we become dependent on using their API. If they go out of business or their VCs decide a business model is better served through surveillance, then all of your IP data, all of the log files on the server are persisted for the, the venture capitalists who, who, to take inventory. 
for them to take possession of all of that information. It's not about whether or not we trust the people at these companies today. It's whether or not we trust the people that inherit these companies and buy them out in a few years to come. It would be better if we did not persist that data at all, and if the data is ever persisted anywhere, that it belongs to the commons. In other words, that it belongs to everyone, not just some private group of individuals who want to sell it on to a highest bidder somewhere else and don't give a fuck about your pri privacy or your integrity. You can't be who you really are unless you are private. Privacy is the permission that society gives you to discover who you are. Right? If you are being watched all the time, you can't really be yourself. And so this is important. So let's see where we are on the blockchain. OK, yay, everyone clap. Cheers. No, come on, more, more. OK. All right, so we're now connected to the blockchain. We're downloading blocks. Um, I can see that it's been downloading blocks since uh, my presentation because we are now at block height 390,621, uh, which is about another 15 blocks since we last did it. Now, as standard, the full node runs in headless mode to save resources. So if you just want to use this device as a waterfall model like plug and play, like you just take by it off of Chris and that's fine, you plug it in, it will just work out of the box. But if you want to get more hands on, and I would prefer it if you did, then you need to, uh, you can also interface obviously with the command line, but if you're not that advanced, you can simply uh, do the command startx, which then boots you up into the nice GUI that, that uh, Raspbian comes with. It's a, basically a Debian variant. It's a little bit slow because it's downloading the blockchain at the same time. OK, and we're connected to the Wi-Fi here. You can run this uh, Raspberry Pi, by the way, off a, off a battery. It runs off of these e-cigarette batteries, you know the ones? You can get, they're not very expensive, about 10 euros. Um, so you can actually have it on your belt, going around distributing the blockchain, maybe pinning some IPFS files so that you can be distributing those as well. That would be a good idea, right? Anywhere you are in the world. OK. So um, as well as all the cool stuff I mentioned, we've also got for you a real treat called Ice Weasel. Ice Weasel is Firefox. It's Mozilla's um, ARM version of Firefox. Um, again, a little bit slow because we're running the blockchain in the background to see 99% CPU usage. And then we can use a lovely, um, oh, it's going to load up my previous session. OK, great. CryptoCat is loading up. OK, so CryptoCat, who knows about CryptoCat? OK, good. It's not peer-to-peer, -peer, unfortunately, but it's the best we've got so far in terms of latency and reliability and so forth. It was, it was the best I could do, OK? So we're going to join a room called Full Node. That was what it was called, right? Full Node. Uh, I published this on the web, and I can click Connect. It's going to, it's this RSA, so it's a little bit slow on the ARM processor because our RSA is not so good. If you want to produce um, a, a PGP key on, on this device, you can. Uh, if you make it 4K, it will take you about 15 minutes um, of like just typing in some randomness. One of the things I'm really keen on doing is maybe selling some, some of those uh, board game dice. You know the ones I mean that you get with those old board games? And just turning it into a game, like people can just roll the dice nine times, type in the numbers, and they create their own entropy. Okay, so now you know it's secure, right? Um, so hopefully this is going to work. I might have to, to stop the blockchain. I might have to actually stop Bitcoin from, from running in order to get this to work. OK, so I'm just going to tell the Bitcoin command line in space to stop. Bitcoin server stopping. And that should speed things up because you can see we're at 100% CPU. Um, as standard, the Raspberry Pi is not overclocked. It does have a cooling fan in it, but you can overclock it yourself if you want to, if you want to get a bit more faster speed. OK, so that isn't working. But luckily, I came up with a backup plan. Ha ha ha. Because I have it right here. So I can still communicate. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, we're in. Everyone, round of applause. OK, so now um, I can say hello. Oh, I do know another German word. Um, and here you can see Sam. And Sam is in uh, Delhi at the moment. He's in, he's in India. And he is also using IPFS. So if I go over to the Pi and I go IPFS, uh, in it, which is initialization. I'm not sure if I did this already before. Oh, I did already do it before? OK, then that's fine. Um, so I go IPFS uh, daemon. Now, you're the expert. You're the program. The, the actual right. developer is right here in front of me, so I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> I've only used a little bit. OK, so it's initializing the daemon. 
And then one of the things I want to try and demonstrate is that Demon is ready. OK, so we can set up another instance. What I'm going to ask, uh, oh, OK, so Devin's in there as well. That's great. Uh, Devin works for Alexandria. Let me just show you quickly what Alexandria is. Alexandria is basically similar to sort of like a gateway uh, for IPFS. Um, at the moment, in order to view files and articles and videos on IPFS, you actually have to have IPFS installed. And not everyone is comfortable with the, with the command line interface. So alexandria.media is a way to be able to interface with the IPFS network uh, without you having to install it. So I can click on, for example, the video of Imogen Heap. Um, this works with, by the way, um, oh, you can also pay for it, I'm told. I didn't know that. I didn't know I had to pay for it. But um, the cool thing is that this works with ProTip, so people can publish their content to IPFS. Um, other users can then set up IPFS gateways, and then content producers and also the content delivery networks can be compensated using ProTip. And none of the proceeds go to us, not unless you want them to. You can donate to us and we'd encourage it, but you don't have to pay us, okay? Uh, that's the important thing. There's no middleman in this equation. Um, so yeah, Imogen Heap, that's going to take ages to load just because it's like a really, really slow machine. Um, so can somebody hold the mic for me again whilst I talk to Sam? Ah, oh, so. I'm just going to turn the camera around. Where is Chris? I'm here. I'm already on the live stream. I'm already on the live stream, Sam. I'm already here. Say hi. Hi, hi. Okay, so. OK, I'm going to give that to you, because you're more of an expert than I am. All right. Okay. All right. So yes, there's a high audience. Say hello, Sam. Hello, Sam. Hello. Hello. He's in India, and the NSA cannot see him, unless they're tuned into the live stream, I guess. But ordinarily, if there weren't a live stream, they would not be able to interfere with our communications. No one would be able to. Um, OK, so what I need now is I need the hashes. He's on a 30 sec If he's watching this on the video, he's going to get a 30-second delay. So let me tell him that. So I'm just going to ask him for the hashes. So, so picture this, if you will, OK? So let's say you're in a country there's a high level of corruption. You don't want to speak your mind because you fear threat of violence. You need to be able to set up a pseudo identity so that you can report on the corruption without fear of reprisals. So what you can do is you can get one of these full notes pledged. I'm an activist. I'm raising the money for, the, for these people. And I can send one of these in parts if I have to, with Veracrypt hidden volumes if I have to, uh, piece by piece to these people in these countries so that they can set them up locally, so that they can receive uh, and send encrypted communications and publish articles that are critical of uh, oppressive regimes in these, in these nations without any way of knowing who they are. They can set up a pseudo identity. They don't have to give their real name. They just have to, to, to give themselves a given name, and then automatically it, it, it just appears. Um, no one can take it down again. OK, he has hashed the folder. So I'm going to copy that to the clipboard. I don't know. Copy. Now, if the, uh, I actually don't know. Let me ask him. OK, here we go. Oh, yes. The developer of IPFS, everybody. Ah, uh, so the keyboard is a uh, German layout. What, yeah. do what do you need? OK, so look at this. It's live coding. It's Let's messy. See it Let's see if it works, everyone. If the pie can find everybody on this crappy Oh, 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 oh. Oh, I found it. It found it. OK. Oh, All good. right. There is a folder. There we go. Okay, so now open up one of those files. I'm oh, he's got one of Snowden. Let's lo load up the one of Snowden. Here, I mean, let me point the camera this way. Ah, oh, Janine is ready for the picture of Snowden. <laughs> uh, where is Poland? Is that Poland? Yeah, that's colon 88. I, I don't know that the web UI is always uh, perfect. But let's have a look. Uh, like that. We're using 16% CPU at the moment. Okay. Uh, do you want me to lift up the browser? One sec. I got it. Oh, oh ooh, yeah, you've got right, trackpad, so trackpad. OK, so uh, Snowden. Let's look at Snowden. Let's look at Snowden. OK, way. OK, it's come all the way from India. Oh, come on. Tough crowd. All right, go back, go back, go back. Let's look at something else. 
Oh, we're going viral. We're going viral. People are coming over. Uh, stay out of the beamer. Okay, click on uh, share temple at night. Temple at night. Let's take a look at this. So this is a picture that is local to Sal Salmitra. Um, picture, if you will, that this was some kind of incriminating evidence against some kind of oppressive regime. I couldn't find anyone off the top of my head ready for this presentation. I did put a call out, but no one was stepping forward. But just so you know, we're ready to go. If, if anybody wants to just tell the truth and tell it early and tell it to the people that need to hear it, you've got the tool right here to do it. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is basically the town where, where Sam lives, and he is sharing it on a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. And a PDF. And a PDF. If the Raspberry Pi can render it. Yeah, it can. Oh. Raspberry Pi can render a PDF. <laughs> there you go. So this is so. So imagine this is like some like really critical article of some like, you know, imagine this in North Korea. Like, wouldn't that be cool? Everyone's gone quiet. I don't want to get shot. North Korea scary. Okay. It's a scary place. Uh oh. I think the FBI just turned up. I, <laughs> Can you maybe sum up for us what's yeah. more what happened here? Because uh, I think a lot of people also don't know what is IPFS. Yeah, yeah, but they should. And if they don't, then frankly, like, do you not know how to use DuckDuckGo? Is that too difficult for you? Just go to DuckDuckGo.com, type in IPFS. Um, they've got a super easy um, instruction. In fact, okay, let's hold people's hands. Let's let's do. Okay, yeah, go for it. I mean, hey, David, or David, do you want to do you want to give a quick? Do you want to like explain real quick what we've got? Go ahead. Okay, so this is IPFS. Just what happened to the process? How do you... So the question is, I think we're understanding that uh, this helps to um, distribute knowledge uh, even in, in some places where it can't be blocked from anyone. But uh, I think a lot of people would be interested to actually understand uh, what the technical part, the background is, what, what has actually happened there. We saw CryptoCat, we saw IPFS, maybe you can explain a little bit uh, more in detail. Like can yeah, go for it, go for it. All right, Introduce so, yourself. Uh, all right, um, I'm Why Are You Sleeping? Um, is this, is this uh, get more close to your mouth. Yeah, yeah that's okay. it. Hear me. Cool. Uh, I'm Why Are You Sleeping? I'm one of the devs of IPFS. Um, and so what has happened here is the, the reporter in India right now has added a file in IPFS on his computer and he gives the hash to us and what happens is the hash uh, cryptographically verifies that that file is what we think it is. Okay, sorry. That thought was really yeah, close. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the hash cryptographically verifies that what we get is what he's sending us. And that way, you know, there's no tampering with the data from him to us. It's guaranteed to be what we expect it to be. Um, we can guarantee that the hash is, you know, the value he's sending us is what he's sending us because we're using CryptoCat, and that is, um, you know, we trust CryptoCat to send us that. So he adds it on his computer and sends us the hash. We request the hash here. You can see this is localhost 8080, which means this is running on the Raspberry Pi, not on a website anywhere else, not, you know, on some service somewhere. This is running on that Raspberry Pi. Um, and then you can see the hash after it. And what that's doing is it's going through the IPFS network and searching for that content. And when it finds the content, it transfers it directly peer to peer from him to us and then loads it for here, here for you to see. And this is all completely decentralized. There's no re requirement for a centralized server or anywhere. It just manually, dis it just, not manually, but it automatically discovers you know, where things are and goes and gets them in a secure way. And you don't have to worry about any data being tampered with along the, that path. That right. Yeah. yeah, now there's, there's one other thing I, I want to say here, which is philosophically, if you bear with me, I know, I know philosophy makes everyone like run away, please stay with me. Okay, the internet did something very important. It allowed existence to emerge without a stable spatial referent. And that is vital because it means that the same rules apply in the same way everywhere in the world, regardless of geolocation. We can all share in the multiple of simultaneous or asynchronous appreciation of 24 hours of Nyan Cat on YouTube if you want to. The problem was that it didn't capture some vital property of nature itself, which is the stable spatial referent, which gives rise to scarcity. So what Bitcoin did is it added scarcity into the equation. It is digital scarcity. On a blockchain, you only have to tell the truth once in order to be heard. You understand? You don't have to have lots of money and lots and lots of SEO and lots and lots of like, you know, sway with the Google algorithms in order to promote your message. You tell the truth once and it can be linked to many, many times in such a way that it is impossible or very difficult once it's been distributed using IPFS to take down later on. 
This is really a revolution of publishing, and it's a revolution of the commons. It gives everyone an equal voice in the market. Markets, the, the question that Vinay Gupta has posed to us in the past is, can you have a free market without free people? Can you? If we're not free to speak our minds and be honest with one another, then what is a market? It's just a sideshow. It's just, it's just a, a production, a theater. It's not real because we can't be genuine anymore because we're constantly worried about being watched or being told what to do. I've lost a couple of friends recently because they worked for some startups and they said some stuff on Twitter and then it got taken down. And why did it get taken down? Because you need that $400 paycheck or you need to, to pay for that expensive lifestyle and you want to live in London or Silicon Valley and it's going to cost you money. And that can basically influence their voice and, and it really makes me very sad. You don't have to wait for a government to give you an identity anymore. You can assert your own identity now, okay? In a manner that is robust, in a way that is persistent and distributed across the world. So I'm going to now, uh, does anybody have any other questions about the pie before I disconnect it? Yeah. Uh, one more question. So um, uh, I understand that the hash is safe somehow in the blockchain with IP address. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. So if you use alexandria.media, it's stored in foreign coin, for example. Okay. So if you store that hash in the blockchain, do you need a transaction to do it? And if so, does it cost anything? Yeah, it does cost something. Um, it costs like, uh, I think, uh, four cents on the Bitcoin blockchain. And in uh, foreign coin, it must be fractions of a penny because obviously they're a much, much smaller blockchain. Um, so I can actually show you now. Let me just switch over. Can somebody hold my mic for me? So we go. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do now, just give that a second to update, is I'm going to show you an example I found last night. Now, um, I did not um, have enough time because I was bu so busy with other things. I did not have time to do this myself. I could have done it. Um, but this is an example of um, the, the Bitcoin D creates raw transaction command. So you saw we did earlier, we did Bitcoin command line interface, get info. Well, that's just a very basic command, just tells you the state, just tells you how many blocks it's downloaded, and it tells you how many blocks it's due to download in the future. And that's very well, and that's very good. Um, yes, it allows, you know, people like um, Anna Kanani here, um, who we saw in the presentation upstairs, if you were there. This is uh, Ala Kanani. She's in Botswana. Um, she is a Southern African representative there. Uh, she is due two full nodes that I will send out when I get back to England in, uh, in a couple of days. She's going to get two full nodes, and we're going to raise her some money that the Bitcoin Foundation never did. We're going to raise her some money um, to help her have a persistent internet connection and a place where she can teach people to build their own tools, sorry, to build their own tools on top of the blockchain. Okay, so they can build their own APIs because the problem is that when you go to countries like this and you say here have this ready-made a la carte like you know the Gates Foundation whatever you know use the slate you know give us your real name give us your IP address this is basically neo-colonialism we haven't changed anything we're just maintaining the status quo what you do is you go to another culture and you say well look this is the discovery our culture made what do you make of it Here's what we've got. What do you bring to the equation? Maybe this isn't finished yet. And maybe there's something we can learn from you. Instead of going to them and forcing onto them first names, last names, street addresses. I mean, there's a, there's a Silicon Valley company right now that is funding in Ghana these, these Google bot camera things that go around streets taking pictures for street view. And do you know why they're doing that? It's so they can tax people. It's so they can find you. What governments want is fixity. Politicians turn up to take care of their own interests, to keep an eye on their interests, to maintain the status quo. They're not there to innovate, they're there to do the opposite. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to enable people to have financial independence and a free voice. And with this full note for £100 of, of equipment and $3 an hour of my time, I'm charging the equivalent of a Foxconn battery worker in my Steve Jobs uniform, live on air. You can watch me on the World Crypto Network next year when I resume around the 6th of January. Um, I will make these nodes whatever cost to my health, whatever cost to my financial services, because I believe in this, and I'm just sick and tired of people selling out and going and getting jobs at these startups. So, I want to show you what, what can be really, really powerful when you put these two together. They have got everything they need on this pie to show you what I'm about to show you. So this is on, on Stack Exchange. Um, actually, for the viewers at home, let me just do a share screen as a courtesy so that they can see what I'm talking about. Okay. So. 
This is on Stack Exchange. I can post the link up later on my Twitter to show you all. And this is just somebody that asked a question like, how, how can I use the op return, right? How do I put metadata into the blockchain? The Bitcoin blockchain at present has 588 petahashes of computing power ongoing. It is orders of magnitude the most powerful computing network the world has ever seen. You're not taking this thing down. Like, really, you're not taking this thing down. Um, so when you put uh, metadata, like this into the blockchain, what you're able to do is you're able to persist that data forever. So if I take the transaction ID, so you can see the command here, Bitcoin D, well this is an old post, it would be Bitcoin clean now, get raw transaction. I can just copy the uh, trip transaction ID, go to one of the centralized services like blockchain.info, no disrespect to blockchain by the way, I think they're really nice guys, but as I say, we can't trust nice guys, like, you know, like we don't, because what, what are the next owners uh, going to do? And we scroll to the bottom, what we notice is, look, we've got the same data here that we saw in the command here. So this is basically hexadecimal, and if I copy that hexadecimal, and I go to, uh, whoops, okay, I cheated, I did it earlier, sooner than I wanted to. Okay, pretend you didn't see that. Uh, and I paste the hexadecimal into here, you'll see that it converts into plain text. And this is because it's basically an ASCII to, to uh, the reason you can't do this in plain text is because obviously you can't type plain text into, into the Bitcoin JSON RPC. You have to put it in hexadecimal. But you can use a simple tool. You don't have to do it through the browser. You could probably install something on the Raspberry Pi. You can just convert the hexadecimal, uh, sorry, convert your plain text. Maybe it could be the, the IPFS hash into hexadecimal. You use the create, you use Bitcoin dash CLI, create raw transaction, and then you, you input this JSON here and you send it. You don't have to do it from the device. You can do it from another computer on the same network. Um, you can actually, uh, let me see if I can. I don't know that it'll let me do it because of the um, oh, apps. So if they've got firewalls running, it might not work, but you never know. They, they can log in without knowing the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. No, okay, they've got firewalls running. But um, if you're on the local area network, you can just set up the, the Pi without a monitor or a keyboard. You can go in through your laptop and type in SSH uh, pi at full node dot local. So you don't need to know the IP address. And then once you're in, you're into the command line interface. And then what you can do is author your, um, you know, your, your exposés and all your leaks on, on, on your laptop. And then you can publish them and timestamp them through the command line just by copying and pasting the JSON. So again, we don't own this. I don't want to own this. If you go to full node dot pro tip dot is, this is our own art project. It, it takes you to my Git repo. This is my Git repo. You can see it's just four text files at the moment, or three text files at the moment. I have documented in detail every single thing I did, including the mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes. I made a, a really embarrassing mistake where I wasted about 12 hours of my time because I wasn't using the DD command correctly or something I don't know went wrong with my USB. So I pretty much wasted a whole day live on air. You can watch my humiliation. I'm not going to leave it there. I'm not going to take it down because otherwise I'd be a hypocrite. Um, but you can see the instructions to build one yourself. You don't have to buy it off of me. I want to cover the full range of Zeus's triangle. You, on the one end you have convenience, on the other end you have security. If you want convenience, you can buy one off of me for 100 pounds. I pledge to make up to 500 of these. I've made 20 already for the price of a Foxconn factory worker, live on air, $3 an hour. I will give you a signed certificate in PGP printed out with some nice ASCII at the top. It's really nice. Uh, I'll give you that, and that comes with it, and you get to own that, and you can sell it on eBay or do whatever you want with it. I'd rather you did something useful with it. I'd rather you hacked with it. But most of all, what I need you to do is I need you to put in pull requests. I need you to start writing code for this. I want you to write bash scripts that allow people to automatically update the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin D client when the developers release a new update. I want people to write scripts that maybe you know, convert the ASCII into, into hex so that people can do the, the JSON a little bit more easily. Okay? I want you to build on top of this. I built this so that you could build on top of it so that we can directly help other people all around the world without any intermediary. What do you think? Yeah. What do I hear? Yeah. Do I hear a round of applause? Okay. Yes. Questions, questions. Yes. Where can I have a copy of the stream? At the World Crypto Network. So um, at World Crypto Net on Twitter and World Crypto Network on YouTube. And also we have Ryan here. Um, if you follow, let me just show you. Okay, let me just show you. So this is my Twitter stream here. 
this is the like the canonical place to find me. Uh, I'm at Mr. Chris Ellis. Okay, just follow me. Just say hey, we met, and I'll follow you back, and then I'll just send you. I'm going I'm to be publishing all the links. I published the link to this one just now. There it is. So live at w 3 w 32 c 3 uh, full node, and obviously the full node hashtag is, is I'm, I'm trying to get this to go viral, right? There are other companies like Bitseed, for example, that are already doing this. Um, they're not doing it in quite the way I would prefer it done, but that doesn't matter. It's open source. That's what open source is all about. Uh, where you disagree philosophically, you fork, right? That's the power of the fork. Um, but they, they have a different processor that's slightly faster, so you get some efficiency gains, but theirs don't come with IPFS and Tor and, and GNU PG and all, all of those other cool things. So yes, the, the links you can find through here. You can also find ProTip at ProTip HQ. And I'm also you know, very active there. And uh, Janine, uh, my uh, wonderful girlfriend, Janine Karina, she tweets out regularly too. You can follow her. Um, and she tweets out all sorts. She, she actually knows like everything there is to know about WikiLeaks. She's read all the fucking cables. She knows like exactly what uh, Hillary Clinton was doing on the 2nd of July, 2015. Like it's incredible. And that's what we need more of. We need more citizens like that. Citizens to take responsibility and take ownership. And you know, everyone is the leader now. Um, so with that, any other questions? Say again. Oh, the PDF is on Alexandria. So let's go to Alexandria. Uh, not that one. OK, so what am I looking for? Books or? OK, great. OK, so this is alexandria.media. Um, they are a uh, gateway for IPFS, which means that you don't have to run IPFS locally in order to be able to get access to the files. I'm guessing that's downloading. Refresh it. I can also show, actually, I, let me show you the, um, this one. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, so Imogen Heap, uh, her website is also compatible with ProTip. Um, she's a singer. Uh, she, you know, she's very famous. Uh, this, this video right here is streaming off of IPFS. It's not streaming. I mean, to some extent, it's pinned on the Alexandria servers, right? But it, 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 the gateway, yeah. Um, but th this stuff can be streamed from people's computers. We live in a server-rich paradigm at the moment, where we basically are uh, being parasitical as consumers on these large corporations. The wonderful property that IPFS has is it has a property called Stigmagy. Does anyone know what Stigmagy is? Put up your hand if you know what Stigmagy is. Really, you should know what Stigmagy is. This is what Larry and Sergey were studying at Stanford before they invented uh, Google. They were studying the way ant colonies and, and things like it in biology are able to discover food. Does anybody know how ants discover food? OK, the way they discover food is, oh, you do? They uh, are uh, they get out and if uh, one finds uh, a source, it uh, places back in place uh, on the track of pheromones, I think. So yeah. others can follow the track of pheromones. But, uh, Perfect. So what happens is the ant goes out to find the food. As it does so, it lays down a trail of pheromones and it leaves the scent. If it is successful in finding the food, it survives. If it survives, it retraces its scent and lays down a stronger scent. If you were to have a bird's eye view camera and a time lapse, what you would see is desire lines, what are called desire lines in, in the lingo. That means the lines that get stronger over time are the ones which lead to the food. Necessarily so, because the ants that survive come back to retrace their steps. So. Larry and Sergey studying, studying stigmagy at a university called Stanford, which prides itself on heterodox doctrines and, and getting people from the sciences to communicate with the people from the humanities. They were researching this and realized you could use this as a way of working out what were good research papers, right? Because what you could do is just look at all the citations in the research papers, put them in a massive array, and then just see whichever ones get the most citations, and then there you have it. You've got a list, okay? Because everyone has discretionary attention. You can only think one thought at a time. You can only look in one direction at a time. What should you be doing at any given moment? It's a very philosophical existential question. We developed lists because of this. And we've had lists ever since the Ten Commandments and before. And that's what Google is. It's a big fucking list. But it's a list that works off of something called stigmagy. The problem with Google was that by 2006, they were hemorrhaging money. Uh, the information that I got at the time was that an average search cost about 20 cents. Right? They were hemorrhaging cash. So Eric Schmidt had to say, right, we're cutting up all the credit cards and we need to find a business model. And that business model was advertising. And that's what we've been lumbered with. They stole the idea off of Bill Grossman. There was some like, legal action. They resolved it. But essentially, the idea was that the green 
links were the paid for links and the blue links were the organic links. And ever since then we've been stuck with this fucked up model which is unsustainable. And it only serves to promote the interests of people that are already wealthy. So IPFS basically distributes this model. It says if you like some content that you've found on IPFS you can pin it. Pin it is the verb. It's a bit like liking something. Okay, and when you pin it, you become a host for that file. That is the stigmagenic property that Google found in the 90s, but now it's decentralized. If you like something that Salmitra from India said, you can pin it to your IPFS instance, and now you can start serving it out to other people, and you don't have to rely on these large companies running these large, redundant data centers with all the air conditioning. You can start repurposing old equipment, running IPFS servers, timestamping it in Bitcoin, timestamping it in Florin coin. I don't really care, as long as you're doing something and taking action. Another question. What keeps me there from creating artificial interest group with multiple um, cellular identities or something like that? So one attack vector could be that the NSA, for example, could start creating an alternative version of history. They could start publishing their own content on IPFS and saying this isn't what happened, this is what happened. Here's the problem. They are bound by the same laws of nature that we are. They're bound temporally as we are. We, 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 are all, we all have 24 hours in a day and everything has to happen in a sequence. So let's say I publish some inflammatory article that is critical of the NSA and the NSA get hold of it and decide to make a modification on IPFS. They essentially create a new hash of the file. But the problem is that hash comes later in the sequence than my one. So if you want to find my one, you simply look at the Merkle DAG, the direct acyclic graph, and you see what hash came prior and you read the original. Oh, this is awkward. So what have, the, what have the NSA now done? They basically reinforce the network. By trying to infiltrate the network, they end up making the network stronger. Every time you punch the network and you try to change the state, all you do is add to it. You can't delete it. You can't delete what I initially said. Every citizen gets a voice. And when that voice is there and it's time stamped and someone tries to make a change to it, my statement remains. And their statement is an addition that came later than mine. They can't change the chronology. How is this different from uh, fighting against a large group, say on Wikipedia, for example, a friend of mine, musician, um, she got an article on um, Wikipedia about herself and she constantly keeps editing it because people <coughs> write some bullshit into it and she's, they don't even care that I am the person behind the article and uh, that I knew best and uh, still that they don't. Sure, okay. Um, so, to some extent, like this is a marketing problem and an amplitude problem. If you want me to, I can go into the philosophy of that. It's going to take a little bit of time. So, Cleisthenes, the ancient Greek uh, aristocrat, invented democracy in response to the mob. His city was overthrown by the Spartans and he needs to take back control. He looks through the history books and he finds this idea called democracy, demos kratos, people power, or more something like the right for the people to do things, the right for the, the, the people to take direct action and self-determine. So he comes up with this idea and says, look, will you stop fighting if I all give you something called a vote and we can all meet every two weeks and have a say on how we run our affairs in Athens? And everyone goes, okay, I will settle. That's what he invented, a settlement system, okay? Democracy and markets both rely on the same underlying logic. Never say anything in that doctrine about you being happy with the result. They only say that you won't come to violence. That's what they're there for. The current paradigm is entirely geared towards the avoidance of catastrophe at all costs. That's how the current political paradigm is, is, is centered. It's geocentered and this is centered. Now, to address your point, later on, you get market logic. Markets are the same things as democracy, but with one important variable that's changed. The amplitude of every actor in a, in a democracy is equal, but the amplitude of every actor in a market is different and varying, vastly varying. In a market, your voice, your amplitude is dependent on how much money you have, and how much money you have is dependent on any previous actions that may have occurred. Some of those actions may be meritorious, maybe you did something good with your life, or maybe you stole the money or you inherited it. But the first thing you, when you ask somebody when you meet them is not how much money do you have. You ask them where they come from, you ask them what they do, what sort of music they're into, what's your favorite color, right? So markets are not perfect, and neither is democracy. When it comes to the internet, the internet liberated that freedom of information, but as I mentioned earlier, you know, companies like Twitter or Facebook, they can shape the information. information. Even on Wikipedia, they can shape the information. Now, if you control the information in a system, what else do you control? You control the beliefs of the people in that system, because beliefs are based on information. 
If you control beliefs, what else do you control? You control the actions of the people in that system because actions are predicated on beliefs. And if you control actions, you control prices, you control everything. And Wikipedia is not immune to this. So what we need to do is create our own Wikipedia. Everybody needs to have a Wikipedia. Everyone can self-host. And the discovery mechanism could be peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't have to be based on a DNS like routing to a domain name that everyone can remember and everyone just types in the domain name into Google and then Google gives them Wikipedia. Anyone can write their Wikipedia. Anyone can. It's based on the protocol that we share, not based on a, a URL or a domain name. That was a thorough answer. I know it was exhaustive, but it was a thorough answer. Yeah, but I haven't gotten the point where, um, it, um, where it eliminates um, the havoc that our large groups create that want to believe some crazy thing. Excuse me. So let, so, okay, so let, let's test my argument more then. So let's say, let's bring up a new paradigm. The, the next paradigm is the committee of liars, okay? Committee of liars is a vector of attack on, on a particular network state where a whole bunch of people get together and collude to lie about a particular state of affairs. So let's say the NSA get together and say that uh, Kennedy wasn't assassinated or something like this, okay? So what ha has to happen now is these frauds have to work really fucking hard to compete against the police, the, 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 the people, the citizens in, in, the, in, the, in the citizenry. Kleisten, he's made this, the following observation. He said that the police were very, very good at recognizing inauthenticity. Right, so when they hear a lie, the wisdom of the crowd will know you're bullshitting. If you went up on the hill of sticks and you made a false claim on the stage, a bit like X Factor, imagine X Factor in ancient, in ancient Greece, okay? Uh, if you were, were booed or heckled three times, you were put in the jail, right? You were, you were sent to jail. You were told, like, no, you're ostracized, okay? Ostracism is the threat that you face. So if the committee of liars wants to brute force something that is false into the world scenario, into the, the, the history of the world, they have to work really fucking hard and they will face epic trolling by the police, by the mob, by the people that Cleisthenes had to overthrow. He only got them to put down their weaponry and their arms when he offered them a settlement system. The, the NSA or any other conspirator or committee of lies has to work really fucking hard because other people have equal access to the truth. They can't block your access to IPFS. They can't block your access to the blockchain. Well, okay, infrastructural dependencies uh, are varying and we have to work on those. But once you have equal access to that, they can't take that away from you. So that all you're gonna do is you're just gonna end up with a fork. Your story exists and their story exists, but you only need one other person to agree on what the truth is with you and you've got your version of events. How, how, how else can I, can I answer you? Stay with my example, then we're not even talking about somebody going up against the NSA, but against some um, other musicians that uh, read and, uh, and uh, re-edit Wikipedia, not, not some superpower. And uh, it's just some people out there who think they know better, mm -hmm. and it, it is just about information about some yeah. underdog musician. Yeah, but to bring you back to my earlier claim, uh, the problem with Wikipedia is that it gets buried under the surface, and Wikipedia has a, a monopoly at the moment on what gets put on the front page. Very few people click on the edit button. With this system that I'm proposing, you wouldn't have the edit button. Everyone would be free to host their own Wikipedia. Everyone gets to be WikiLeaks, everyone gets to be Wikipedia, everyone gets to run DuckDuckGo. Okay? Sorry that that was such a long reply. It was a very good question. I'm, I just I'm, tend to be very verbose, that's all. Any other questions? I've got all day. No? Okay. Are we ready to wrap? Okay, thank you very much. You can find me at Mr. Chris Ellis on Twitter, at World Crypto Network. You've been great. Thank you.